you really learn to look. And it pays off that suddenly you begin to see wonderful things in your daily life you never noticed. And I would say it's one of the most wonderful presents you get in an art education to enjoy seeing. Training the eye is very, very important. You can't come up with ideas if you don't see first. What interested me was to teach students to see in an abstract manner. So not to see an object, but to see it as something round or square, something textured or smooth, and to translate what they see into a form language. The assignment to place five lines in a given format shows how little you need to make the negative area come to life. Placing two squares in a given format to show how many different ways you could handle this assignment. I gave students a nine-square grid, which, as ordering principle, allowed them to come up with a coherent composition. The actual design elements were up to them. The limiting is important that students have a very clear playground set up, and it helps them to focus. Graphic design, it's seeing and envisioning. The eye has to move around enjoyably. There's nothing where you get stuck. It all flows and holds together. There's nothing unnecessary. In all of these exercises, the control of the negative area is very important. In another year, I decided to work with letter and image combinations. She'd say, hold that safety pen and look at it carefully. And do you really see that kind of reflection that you're drawing here? Or even if you're not seeing it, what's the difference between the object and the quality of the object, the coolness of the metal, the reflectivity? She would talk in these terms. And yet we're still doing just a black and white drawing. It's about abstraction, it's about simplification, and she would have a way of getting you to see differently, see deeper into the object. I chose the image because the original is a Greek relief I always loved and had a photograph of in my studio. The linear translation of the original relief came from another piece of art I greatly admired and loved, which were the woodcuts of Mayol. So it's linked to two areas I greatly cared about. And I recall a very nice statement by Herbert Mutter. He told me once, if you love something, the work will be just fine. The connection that I really see between Inga and Herbert Mutter is that uh, he said that he was not interested in what things were. He was interested in what things were doing. And as a photographer uh, and a designer and an artist, he being all three, that was the continual question, is to go beyond what it is and try to understand what it's doing. The Beethoven poster was done in 1979. I thought as a visual idea to use the 
contrast of light and dark, which evokes some similarity of Beethoven's life, who went from depression to very active working periods. The large bee was a very early idea. The notation is authentic from a manuscript of a Beethoven score. The echo of the staff lines also came relatively quickly, but I didn't know where the poster would go from there. But staring at it, and that is something very interesting when you work on a poster, to give yourself time to stare at it and see what's there, what does it want, what's possible. Because with the first few elements one puts down, there is already something set in motion. So I noticed the large E in the negative area. And with that, the idea for the poster was pretty clear to spell out the word Beethoven. The elements are very much in the realm of music notation. The important text, of course, was repeated in the headline. But the word Beethoven is not readily apparent and viewers have to puzzle a little bit to read it, which gave students on campus great joy to see who figured it out and who didn't. When I think of Inga, I think of someone who really finds the beauty in things. And she really, that was the inspiration for me as a student. And probably many students can say the same thing. A good student assignment guides students through a number of important experiences. I had collected over time some beautiful old labels. So I distributed them among the students and ask them to create a new edition. They had to recreate the letters on the label, draw any image that appeared on the label, and prepare color separations to have hot metal plates done. They had to mix the ink and print the labels in proper registration on a small letter press. So they learned about designing letters, they matched the letters on the original label, they designed the marks on the label from scratch, carefully matching the same quality, they learned about color separation, how to get the individual colors on separate hot metal plates, about ink mixing and the printing itself. So that's a terrific experience. And the students loved the project because it had a clear goal. The drawing is something that um, I really do credit Inga uh, as, as uh, kind of my, my main influence because it started from this very fa fundamental foundation. I draw every week. I draw in the studio. Uh, I draw from a model. I've learned to uh, love the activity of, of life drawing. Uh, it's very, very difficult, even to this day. I, I've been doing it regularly for over 10 years, every Friday morning for three hours. I don't go to church, but I do this every, every week. So in this process of the education in Basel, developing the ability in students to see in many different drawing courses, in courses observing light and shadow, in texture drawing, drawing in museums, drawing in marketplaces. You really become visually aware. And frequently in the winter, animals were brought into the classroom. They would move around in a cage and you better hurry to capture the essence. I went into my foundation program at the Philadelphia College of Art and had some great drawing teachers. But it was never done in a somewhat analytical way, seeing volume, seeing shading, seeing proportions, until I started to draw with Inga. 
I can't tell you how frustrated I was until I got it, until I learned how to draw a freehand cube. We did object drawings, which would bring in the drawing of the cylinder. I remember drawing a juice bottle and the constant correction, the constant back and forth. Uh, it could be very trying at times, but also very satisfying once you got it. That was the wonderful thing. You said, oh, that's how that series of ellipses fall in the vertical alignment of this bottle. Oh, that's why I can, you see less at the top than you do at the bottom. Those kinds of things, they are like a revelation when you finally see it. And once you do, and you've done it yourself without someone kind of taking your hand and, and, and making you do it, once you do that yourself, you absolutely never forget it. So a dot is the most flexible element, right? You can arrange it in lines, in planes, in random clusters. All the different possibilities how you can compose dots in a given format and really go through all the issues of contrast, direction, texture. There were two early exercises we did uh, in the first year with Inga. One was doing letter forms and the other was something that we called Inga lines. And there were these lines that you made on a page and they were darker at the beginning and darker at the end and they thinned out in the middle and they were supposed to be evenly spaced on the page. And I was the worst person in the class at the letter forms and surprisingly the best person in the class at the Inga lines. Because when I talked about the toggling back and forth, which was hard for me between content and the pure visuals, this was just pure visuals. There was no content. So I couldn't get lost in, was it an A or did it say this? There was nothing it said. It was just the lines and it was just your hand control. The classical Roman letter is the ancestor of all later formal developments of our alphabet. From the Roman majuscule to the uncial, half uncial, the Carolingian, which is the first fully developed lowercase alphabet, and then to many variations of black letter, and finally to the humanist script, which is the model for many of our current typefaces. The structure of the Roman capital letter is simple and beautiful. It uses clear geometric elements, the half circle, vertical, diagonal, horizontal. It is based on a grid of square, half square, quarter square. The S is two small half circles. The O is two large half circles. The D is a vertical and a large half circle. So it's like a continuous rhythm of very simple form elements. And that gives the coherence. So you see the carving of a linear writing, which goes back to an earlier period and then the writing with a strong sixth differentiation, which is more of the time of the classical period in Rome. And I always showed students original Roman stone carving, either as photographs, or I would take them to a library or museum to see original carvings. It is important to understand letters as motion, since the Roman letter was originally written. The written letter is a memory of motion. Looking at the SL, there is a wonderful contrast between the flowing curve of an S and the very architectural form of the L. The motion of the large curve of the G 
and then the inverted smaller curves of the S create a nice form contrast but experienced as motion. The negative area between these pairs of different light movements also becomes beautiful because of this contrast. There are, there are two things at work when you're writing. There are two different aspects of writing. And this is an idea that I got from Lloyd Reynolds. One aspect of writing is the eye. And the eye wants to look at an orderly set of marks on a page. The eye wants pattern. The eye wants order. The eye wants relative perfection. The eye wants something that is reliable, that it can count on. The eye is a very conservative part of reading. On the other hand, you have the hand. And the hand is the radical aspect of writing. So the hand wants to write faster and faster. Writing changes because we're writing faster and faster all the time. And the hand wants to write expressively. So when you're writing your signature, you're not thinking about getting every little letter perfect. You're thinking about the way you write your signature. And that's why it's very hard to forge somebody's signature, because you can't do it slowly. You have to write it fast and expressively. That's the radical hand at work. So the whole history of writing can be looked at as an elegant little conflict between the conservative eye, which wants everything perfect and rational, and the radical hand, which wants to write fast and write expressively. And it's this constant battle that makes our environment that we look at when we look at lettering. I did my undergraduate work at Reed College. Reed College at that time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, I decided to take a calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me and we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. When we studied calligraphy at Reed, we studied it exactly the way you study a martial art. You find a good teacher and you watch the teacher do it and you copy what the teacher is doing and then you correct it and then you try it again over and over until the action is completely internalized and you, you make it your own at that point. So it's not just mindless copying, it's copying thoughtfully and correcting thoughtfully until it's internalized. And I think what you learn from watching somebody write is the rhythm of the writing. That it is not just muscle memory, it's a rhythmic uh, memory. It's almost like the beat in music that you're learning when you watch somebody write. I think that Inga Drekkerai came from a slightly different tradition than mine because she studied in Europe and I studied in the Western United States. But I think the thing we have in common is that tool in your hand and that's always where the letters come from. I chose a simplified version of the Roman letter for the brush writing which leaves out the serif. There is a beautiful gradation from thin to thick, which naturally comes out of the flat-edged brush. The brush is parallel to the baseline of the writing. The R combines a rich variety of motions. It defines the optical middle where the two strokes join. In adding the H, you have to carefully compare to the R to make sure the middle of the H is at the same height. All letters on the wall sit on the same baseline to make sure that the height is the same. 
and to also see letters in context with each other. The back and forth of the positive and negative rendering of the letters in paint to get a absolutely smooth and delicate curve. The very essential deep cut of the negative area in the middle of the letter, which links optically to the fine serifs. The patients, when I would think it would be perfect, and she would see all the flaws in it, but never make me feel guilty about it, never made me feel that you've done something bad. The curve has to be a bit refined, the links develop to the vertical. It was always about, you can do it better. I know you can do it better, it was always the message. So it kind of motivated you to do good work. A little funny process. The student developed the R out of the P, but the thin wooden leg doesn't convince. It's already better in the stroke weight, better in the angle, but the student decided it was not what she wanted. So she went back to brush writing, refined the brush writing, and with a few corrections, it's a very beautiful R. Not an easy letter, the V to design a symmetric serif on a diagonal stroke. So this doesn't work. Now it begins to connect more organically to the thin stroke. The two curves of the serifs are good. The fast motion summarizes the changes in individual letters and also now shows the successful family resemblance. The other wonderful thing that Inga taught me was uh, the use of a reducing glass. This is something I don't think most designers have today. I still have mine. But she would put our composition on the floor and then she would stand on a chair with this little reducing glass so that she would get like essentially like 30 feet from this composition which allowed you to see relationships much more, more clearly. So she would stand up there on the chair, again, towering over me and look at the composition. And she would say, I think the two letters, they're not the same weight. And I'm looking at it and I'm saying, yes, they are the same weight. I've measured them, but optically they weren't the same weight. So I learned the difference between geometric accuracy and optical accuracy. This is just a plain italic N, followed by another plain italic N. And what we're trying to do here is to make this space inside the characters equal between the two characters. And we want the space in between the characters to be the same space or a little bit less. And when I say space, I don't mean something you can measure. So you couldn't take a ruler and measure from there to there and there to there and say, well, that should be the same. We're talking about the area of the space. And since these are complicated shapes, it's something that's very difficult to measure. And it's something you just have to learn to do by eye. My students had to design their own typeface. Sometimes students come up with rather wild ideas which seem impossible to turn into a coherent typeface. What brings these wild ideas down to earth are three things. First, the letters in a typeface 
have to share a common structure. This assures evenness within the word picture or the entire text. Second, letters have to be sufficiently distinct from each other to assure readability. And finally, a good typeface needs to have proper optical letter spacing. This assures even rhythm and color. The overall page of text should appear as a smooth gray without any dark or light clusters. A typeface based on Indian script, done with a flat-edged brush, but held at a different angle. Unusual alphabet, with great variation in thick and thins. But the recurrence of thin or thick letters was very carefully thought out. Well-designed typeface based on Korean script. Nice rhythm. Numbers from a parking ticket, which don't exist in any typeface. This alphabet is based on a wide variety of found letters scratched into the wet concrete of sidewalks. The face was then applied to the text of the Odyssey and looks appropriate. In my own design, I worked on a few trademarks and logotypes. When this sign was hung in front of the pharmacy, I found out that the earlier version was done by Walter Kech, who was a very famous Swiss designer. With Manfred Meyer, we designed a wrapping paper for an interior design store in Basel. I used a rubber stamp of the logo and by stamping this image over and over it offered the material to set up a tile pattern. When I came to Philadelphia in the early 70s, Ricky Worman had just organized an Espen design conference on the theme Making the City Observable. In this context, I decided to investigate the various kinds of signage around one intersection in Philadelphia. Each student had to choose one type of sign, for example, metal signs, which would include die-cut metal, stamped metal, etched metal, cast metal, sawed metal, and so on. So there was a whole range of techniques within the theme of metal signs, plastic signs, or neon signs. Next to visually documenting the different types of signs, students also had to write about the various production techniques. The research was published in the magazine Design Quarterly. The issue very quickly sold out because this kind of information was not generally available. For several years during my teaching in Philadelphia, I worked with students on their senior project, which I had developed together with Hans Alleman. The assignment was to choose a text from any area of interest and to reinterpret it using visual and typographic means. The format could be a film, an interactive design, or a book. Most students actually did a book. The design for the book by Bobby received special distinction. It was a real story and a very sensitive content so the designer had to hold back. And a very favorite book on a lighter side 
was done by a student who was unsure of his ability to illustrate a text. So I decided to limit him. He could only use geometric objects for his illustrations and only cut paper. And it turned out just wonderful. Getting to know Edward Tufty made me much more aware of serious information design. Together, we did a brochure for international paper. When we went to Japan, we visited the control center of the bullet train and saw a graphical train schedule. We then applied the same system to an airline schedule of a trip from Atlanta to Chicago. Good survey maps integrate multiple layers of detailed information. They use color intelligently, balancing between hue, gray value, and brightness. Different types of information live together without harming each other. Detail type and symbols survive because the landscape features are kept very light. Brightness is the full saturation of a color and could be defined as the bluest blue or reddest red. The lightest color, on the other hand, is the one closest to white. We also talk about color in terms of gray value or weight. The brightest yellow is close to a 5% gray value. The brightest blue to a 70% gray. The brightest red to about 50%. Bad maps have a dominance of bright colors and simply get noisy. Typographic details get lost in meaningless dark shading of the buildings. It's astonishing how sensitive our eyes are in distinguishing the most subtle variation in color. Gradual value changes are used to show variations of height or type of terrain. The color of the glacier, this typical bluish cast, is very close to reality. And so is the landscape. Even the type and symbols are layered by different size and weight to indicate their significance. It is interesting to see how a poster or cover design are different from information design. Because both have to function at a distance reading, they have to capture the attention of someone walking by and entice them to look at more detailed information. And the Tissy poster functioned perfectly in this way. It's a large Size, the word tissy, could be read from across the street. This poster for the Yale Symphony is more subtle in its form language, but the important information is clearly accessible. The image of the daffodil for a commencement poster at Yale is powerful. It's like a trumpet. Graffiti that's always visualizing an idea, and it's definitely about drawing attention, it's about informing, it's about distance reading, but it's also about symbolizing something. Because like poetry, you have to get the essence of something. was somewhat influenced by Matthew Carter to give creative decisions to the student. 
student, not to influence a student too much, but to throw something in the lap of the student and see what comes out, and then move in carefully and direct. Sometimes they end up in the bushes and I have to dig them out. <laughs> but that's part of teaching. I don't think Inga will have any successors, like Chopin. I don't think she'll have any successors. I think she's, she's one off. You know, Chopin had really no influence. And, and I think in some ways, Inga's influence will not come through visual evidence. It will come through the people that she met and how she changed them and how they go through the world. And I think this is the great moment of studying with Inga, is to leave things behind and finally to see what is before you. And that's how you get to the end. That's how you get to the destination. <laughs> <laughs>